Thanks for taking the time to download this BBC Radio 5 Live podcast. To search for other podcasts you might like, click bbc.co.uk slash 5 Live, where you'll also find our terms of use. Hello and welcome to the Daily Bacon podcast. You join us as ever at the post-show debrief, but it's a three-way split today between me in London, because I'm taking part in a Channel 4 pilot tonight, so I have to be in London. They are letting you into my diary. <laughs> uh, the production team in Salford and st- our friend Steve, my friend, your friend, Steve Evans, in his posh shed, a.k.a. summer house, at the back of his yard in Wolverhampton. Steve, welcome to the prestigious Daily Bacon podcast. Prestigious it is. Oh, well, rich. according to me. Well, you know, I would agree with you too. Uh, uh, what is uh, interesting about the podcast, Steve, is that um, this is the only... I, li- I prefer the people that listen to the podcast mm. to the people that listen live because oh, I, right. I think... Well, I think to listen live is quite lazy. All you have to do is flick the radio on. Whereas to listen to a podcast, and here's a phrase I use a lot, but you, you have to go the extra mile. You have, yes. to, you have to download it. And if I'm honest, I don't really care about the people that listen live. These are the people that matter to me. And that's why I'm more excited about our conversation. We're going to put out the on-air conversation on Mm. this podcast. But I'm more excited about this exclusive podcast-only conversation. Yes. Because it's a treat for the people I care about. Fair enough. Yeah. I I will will answer anything that you ask me. Okay. Describe the posh shed. Um, It's uh, 16 feet wide by 14 feet deep. Uh, and it's fully insulated, so it's warmer than a caravan. It looks like a cricket pavilion, yeah. and it sits two-thirds of the way down my garden. Uh, good looking. It looks good. It's, it's sort of an office space. as well, is it? Is that, was that the idea of it? No, not really. Our office would suggest something that was more work-orientated. It's here for me to do whatever I want to do, so I write obviously, and I do bits and bobs. As a performer and a magician, you're always tatting with one thing and another. And it enables me to have visitors down here with, without Septina because of all the other things that she's stressed doing, having to worry about the house proud a bit associated yeah. with, with visitors that just appear from nowhere because we can have, we all, you know, we all use my old words, you know, we are blessed that you will get three or four visitors just appear huh. and they will have travelled some distance uh, and... Uh, well, perhaps just been passing. A lot of them gigs, a lot of them doing gigs. Remember, I'm just off the M6. So, uh, yeah, and the, the summer house is ideal for that. And let's say so you said is, of course, your, uh, your wife. Of many years, And yes. we will hear you at the end of this podcast. The, the, the moaning is short because we yeah. had uh, such a good conversation. We'll get you back in January. Uh, that's my plan, to do a fuller moaning. Um, and uh, what is striking, I think, in the conversation that people will hear at the end of the podcast is... And now is just how much energy you have. Um, is this, do you have this much energy all the time or is this, is this a performance energy? Yeah, it, 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 it's easier to call it a performance energy. So something I noticed in one of the brief chats we had earlier in the year when I was very low, my blood level, my blood level was very low. Is that when I was against you in hospital? No, it was around that time. And uh, uh, and what happened was that it wasn't in any way negative, but um, I don't I don't have a special radio voice. This is how I talk, you know. And, but I was tired, and I I I wasn't conscious of projecting, you know, uh, because it, it, I was just speaking as if. Yes, I was just speaking to one person rather rather than projecting a bit beyond that. And it did seem people did uh, contact me and said, you sounded very tired. And and that seemed to be the focus rather than what I was saying. So I, I, the last couple of times we've spoke, I have been minded of that. And it's, it's not in any way pretend. It is the energy I've got to speak to you. It is a performing energy, if you will. But it's, it's easier to say it's an excitement. It's a child's excitement of being able to talk on the radio. You know, I'm talking on the radio. It's that sort of thing. And it's, it's you're talking to your best mate. And it's, it's that sort of excitement. And I find I, I can get, with that energy, 
I can get the points over much better. But generally speaking, if I have me if I've got my medication in place and I'm just sitting uh, still and I've I've had food, uh, if you could call it that, what I'm what I managed <laughs> to eat. Um, you, you, you're fine. I'm, and I can, I, I have a good half hour of having a, a good, right. a good yak. And then I do get a bit tired, but it's only it, to be expected. Has this been, um, for you? Cause obviously we're, as you explained in our interview, mm. the, you know, we met in April, you came on the show on the phone in April, we yeah. came to your house in May. Um, and you didn't <laughs> expect to be spending this Christmas with your family. Back no, then. not at all. Um, uh, has this been, uh, an emotional time for you? It's very emotional, Richard. You, you, you're grieving. So um, I can speak on behalf of everyone who's going on this journey because I don't think I'm any different to any of them. I wish I had some of their strengths, to be honest. Um, I see so many amazing people when I visit hospitals, as I've said to you many times. Um, it is an emotional time because you grieve before you go and when you know you're going you, you you each person grieves at different times now i have i have come to the acceptance phase of grievance so so i've accepted that at some point and hopefully not this week or next week but at some point my journey has to come to an end uh, i try to find soft ways of describing it you know the the train will come to its final stop. One of us will get off and then it will move on again. I mean, it's that sort of picture I like to paint. And other people have not there yet. Uh, they they haven't accepted. They're still going through rage uh, and anger and, and, and denial. They're still going through those phases of, of, of grief. So I, I'm not saying I find myself going back in to support them. But, but but I think, in simple terms, I do, because that's just the way friends are, isn't it, really? It must that's... be hard for you to see them going through it. Steve, Absolutely it, through terrible, terrible Richard. It's... But, but um, then again, you see, you can see why some people say the things they do once you get these insights into, you know, Dad won't talk about it. That's the classic, isn't it? Dad won't talk about it. Dad won't talk about it. I don't know who Dad is, but if I could have to guess, I would say that Dad won't talk about it because hey, he doesn't know how to articulate it, which is absolutely not a criticism in point one of a percent. And B, which is more relevant, he doesn't want to burden people. And we experience a few people like that, not a great deal, but a few. And you, you have to say that what they're creating is a burden for later on. It isn't easy. You know, it, 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 it isn't easy at all. But if you can talk about it, if you can share it, um, it is it is a much easier journey than if you're trying to travel it emotionally by yourself. You, you were telling me um, and I asked you if I could bring this up, but you were telling me before we record between the end of the show and before we recorded yeah. the podcast that um, you cry a lot. I do. And that uh, is not going to be a surprise to anyone. But I wondered if is that. Is that a useful experience? Well, it, it's almost vital to me. Uh, um, you imagine someone who talks as much as I do, mm. and you are upset, and and you you're upset. You just it just all gets too much, and you know it's it's not an upset because of of, of incident A at point in time B. It's not that. It's just in a culmination of days of frustration, fear. And then you've got the 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 sort of the the the, the menace that's that's uh that that's the menace that's behind you all the time, you know, this menace that is you you are going to die. Well if you start to get upset, so you bottle it up, you don't get upset. Because if you start to cry through tears, you're then talking to someone and sort of in that way that you do when you cry and talk, you're achieving very little. Well, we've sort of come up with a system whereby I call, and it, it, it is that, it isn't meant to sound condescending. I don't have any of those that, those traits, I would like to think not. And But I, you know, call one of my girls, and it, it, it's basically, it's, it's, it's Sep uh, uh, and, and Megan and Lauren, who are my three girls, and I call them close by, and I put my, my head in, 
the lap and with a pillar, and I cry. And they don't say what's wrong, because that there aren't any words needed. I just need to get the emotion out. So I just cry quite quite properly for three or four minutes. And then when all of the emotion's out, I may then talk to them for a little bit, but then we move on. Now, I don't know how selfish that is, because that can be very destructive to the person that you're in the company of crying to. So that wouldn't work for everyone, but it, it does work for us, because I have asked permission, and, and they do seem fine with it. But yeah, crying to release emotion is an old, old yeah. state sentence, isn't it? It's an old way. And, and Megan and Lauren, you think, cope, cope with that well? They're strong. As I said in the interview, mate, when we were chatting on the radio, I think a lot of people miss what strength is, you know, and what sacrifice is. They are argumentative, combative, and disagreeable. The most beautiful human beings that have ever existed. But they're, they're not without those traits. They have many other beautiful traits. They are kind and considerate and all those things. But for the purposes of traveling the journey, they've had to take key elements in their behaviors and lock them away. And I think when people say, well, if there's anything I can do for you, it goes without saying. You say, yeah, it's fine. And um, when you're in the house, and someone says something ludicrous that's mm. obviously nonsense. C can you not bite their head off yeah. and cause a row right in front of me when I've got a nice little settled world and then just cause uproar? Could you just not do that? I guess as, I guess as well, Steve, for them, I mean, this is the obvious statement as well, it's, it's, this, is, this is very difficult um, to see your dad going through this. And yes, it them, must be, mustn't it? It, it must, must be, be a yeah. difficult balancing act for them of, wanting to tell you how they feel and telling you how they feel and perhaps not wanting to always tell you how they feel? Um, I think that works as a principle with, with, with every family that is listening to this. And, and you, you have to take the bit that works for you. We, we have always said we are only us. And, and there is a point that... That, that it is very difficult to know how to balance those things. We are sharing at the moment, and that is very relevant, uh, via me, with their permission, how we do it. Because people have openly told us that they benefit from it. And these are not invisible people. These are people now who are coming up to us via oncologists and coming up to us in hospital when we're at, uh, at clinics and they're recognizing us and coming and saying thank you for 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 what you do and that. And I, I really don't, as you know, genuinely feel I do a great deal. But there is a relevance to that comment that needs put in, into context. And that is uh, a, a very dear friend of mine called Steve Thompson said, uh, who, who's from school, from John and I's days. Uh, he was always my moral compass, Tom I was, and we lost touch. And uh, we, we've refound our friendship now. And uh, it is a, a really important thing I think to both of us and he was always the moral compass he was always go if I was getting too Larry he would always say enough now mm -hmm. even as a child you know and and I missed that in my life without realizing I did and he said enough now you've got to start thinking about yourself and the girls and this public stuff has got to stop and that you're and, not doing, and that, that's a, there's no more performances is there that you're not doing well the, the, what anymore. he meant was what he meant was the the being concerned when people, I've not got the facility now to go on Twitter and Facebook that I did because I'm simply not strong enough to. I, I do, I, I, I sort of meet it halfway by I post, but now I'm not reading as many as I did and I'm not replying to as many. So there is a less... So that has changed. So that has become more private. What he meant was when these, it starts to get nearer the end and is very private, it isn't the thing to, to, to prioritize. Sharing it yes, should yes, not prior yes. a very... be a priority. 
but he's right, isn't caring he? for those close by should be my priority, and uh, that's and on, what will naturally happen, I think. And on that, just finally, on, this is, we touch on this in the interview, but about Christmas Day. Are you excited yeah. about Christmas Day? Um, I, I am, but for a very selfish reason. Um, you said about retiring from, from gigs and what have you. I made a conscious decision that if it could happen, the Magic Circle lecture would be the last live performance I did because it was such a fantastic way to end. But that's because of strength more than anything else. If I'm still capable of doing things, I still will. Christmas is about sharing and doing things. My My ideal day now is more feeling comfortable, happy and being in the company of people I love. My personal goal, which is, it's up to you whether it, 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 this line sort of makes the edit or not, it is very stressful for a family to have a loved one leave them very close to Christmas. And speaking very, very selfishly, my, my aim is to be here for Christmas because of the extra weight that leaving at that time would put. So I'm looking forward to it but for the reason that it means that I've taken away that extra burden from the girls and then I, I, I'll, I'll relax. But so, you will be there for Christmas. It's, Christmas yeah. is a week away and we yeah. can hear, you know, I, yeah. I, I know I can't medically assess you but well, I know and I can't even see you at the moment but you still have I, quite a lot of strength what, about you. What, what will take me, Richard, will be an incident that is... Um, that is triggered by uh, the tumour. And that could be a massive internal bleed, which is as a 72-hour sort of life. Now, they could, that could occur at any time. Um, now, everyone who is, who is at my stage of the journey will have their own version of that. It's just that I have chosen to use the energies I've got in with the blessing of my loved ones to have this conversation with you and to use the energy I've got. And you, you see how more energised I am when we're speaking because this is not in any way pretense. This is someone who's really enjoying chatting to his mate. And, and, and if I can't do that for reasons of someone else thinking I shouldn't, that's never been our way. And, and I don't think it should be our way now. So, so that's why you've got this, this larger than life, lots of energy character, because the energy I've got is being funneled into this conversation. Because what I do now is really up to me. But the medical side, you should never be too worried because it'll look after itself. But the, 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 end can be a slow descent or it can be something more dramatic than that we just don't know well i've enjoyed chatting to my mate every bit as much as you enjoy chatting to your mate and it's been lovely steve let's leave our, our podcast conversation there and bring on the guest which because i know that i i believe that most people have downloaded this to hear you and i mean that sincerely so here's harry hill we're not going to play the whole of harry hill We've edited this down so you can hear some of Harry Hill on the programme and then we shall return to you and the conversation we had earlier live on the radio and we have a bit of the moaning to come as well. But um, here is Harry Hill. That means now it's all a bit of a veil, isn't it? It's, uh, we're, we're, we're at the point where there's no more uh, strength and, and fitness. It's now just determination and very clever drugs. Let's have, I want to play a clip of when we first spoke because we, I, I kind of met you, if that is the right word, on air over a telephone in April. And then it was May when I came to your house and we broadcast. It's a beautiful day as well, wasn't it? We broadcast. It was your, beautiful, wasn't it? Yeah, from your backyard with your family and, and, and some of your very, very many friends. Uh, and uh, yeah, back in May. For this show. But let's have a listen to, to, to that first conversation. So just for those that may not know the background, you have terminal stomach cancer and you, you shared your insights with us all year. Um, you've been uh, consistently uh, hilarious as well. Um, <laughs> Thanks, mate. And no, I really do genuinely mean that as well. 
as anyone who follows his programme will know and agree. He's done some great stuff recently, you know, some I, absolutely amazing stuff. Just when you thought the stuff that you that you and I have been party to, we couldn't top. I just don't see it coming, you know. The, the adventures we've had over the last few weeks have been just mind-numbing, really have. Have they? Well, oh. look, Give me an example. What, what do you mean by that? In what do you way? want to do the clip? Or, or do you yeah, let's to... do the clip. Okay, yeah. Let's examine what you meant by that. But um, uh, my other point I was going to make is that whenever you're on, we just have this overwhelming response, not only from people on text immediately, but um, uh, on Twitter. It just goes for days and days and days. No interview I ever do on this show has a response that lasts that long, if you like, from the audience. Yeah. Um, so, Steve, uh, this is what you told me when... We first spoke in April. I, I have been blessed. I'll use the word a lot. Uh, my condition is without symptom, mm. other than the fact that it affects my blood. But I've been told that really, at this point, without the treatment, I, I, I've only just started the treatment, and, and I'm not what my prof calls tight, which means I've still got a bit of time. But all I would have is no hope. I would simply be trundling along to an inevitable climax. What effect that will have at some point in the future when I visit that period of the journey, phone me again and I'll talk to you then. Cancer isn't always a negative. If you ever see a group of people, if you ever go to a cancer ward and you see a, um, a, a waiting room full of people who, who are obviously cancer patients, never look at those people. As never look at that room as a box of broken toys, which you are making a very big mistake. What a good phrase that is. S Steve, you know when we spoke in April, did you, yeah. at that point, did you believe that you would be sharing this Christmas with your family? No. No, not at all. It wasn't a, it wasn't a viable proposition for me. Uh, the journey... Uh, isn't easy, is it, friend? I mean, let's face yeah. it, the public, your listeners, our listeners, if you want, have, have become more and more aware of the closeness of you and I over the time. And uh, you know how you feel about it, you know, how difficult it's been over the last few months. What is happening now is what happens to anyone that is on one of these journeys. I, I didn't know what it would be like, Richard, and I shared with you and and I was very emotional about it. I was scared, Richard. I didn't know what it would be like. And the reason I didn't know what it would be like is because it, it was going to be different for me to everyone else. But how it is, is manageable. That's how it is. It's, it seems to be taking place in slow motion. I have the district nurses in now and they come and still support what's left of this ludicrously fantastic journey that, that we find ourselves on. Just when you think everything is done, remember the target that was Buxton. Mm. And remember, Which, what month was it? Was that September? That was the beginning of September. So now, in, in April, you set yourself a target of speaking and performing at a magician's convention, essentially, in Buxton in September, which you did and did very well because we recorded it and transmitted it well thank you mate it was very well received and it, and it was heartening for me but I, what i also said to you was what are we going to do when we get there then because i know i'm not going to go it's all right now you can turn the light off oh, that's not how it works and when i got there there were other things to do but i was ill you came and saw me in hospital you remember and 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 this is how my journey panned out and everyone's is different. Everyone's is different. And we've concluded quite recently that you've got your oncologists and your specialists. But I've always prioritised friends and family. Mm. And as we get into these very latter stages, the most important person, although the prof is, is God in our house, as you know, Professor David Ferry, one of the world's leading oncologists, the person who really is the angel by my side is my wife. Sep. And she's sit, Sep's sitting here now, yeah. Oh, because okay. uh, uh, we're uh, talking to you on a nice gen. Are you in that shed at the back yes, of your yard? Uh, yes, or as, or as nice people would call it, my summer house. <laughs> you know, thanks for doing the impression of being someone who's condescending there, my friend. You carried it off very well. But, uh, <laughs> but the point I was making was that when does this, when does the extraordinary finish? 
when does it end? I, I was in hospital. You were with me. I thought I was going to pass away and found out I'd received the most remarkable of accolades from the Magic Circle. I was made an associate mm. of the Inner Magic Circle. Which, How long ago was that? Well, when, when did I come to Scott? I came to you twice, but within the space of a week or so. That must have been mid-September. Mid-September. Yeah. So then we moved on from that, and, and the Wolves Football Club invited us to a match uh, but before that, even so, so there's nothing else to do. There's, we've done everything that's exciting. And then you'll remember we went to see, because we talked about it on the interview when I was also on the breakfast telly, when we came yes. on the great adventure to Salford. Yeah. And, and that was wonderful. Everyone looked after us so well. We went to the Civic thinking we were going to have tea with Jimmy car and found out I'd, I'd been inducted into the wall of the black country wall of fame right. that's held at the civic halls now i couldn't get me breath that and this sort of thing it, doesn't happen to it, me and that's what you mean by this sort of ludicrously fantastic adventure that you have been on in, it, in the last few months it just keeps going on it, it, it's amazing so we set a point we went to the wolves match they invited us as a guest which was very nice and then just before we went uh, up into the director's box as their guests, they said, oh, would you do a card trick with Steve Ball at half time? Mm. And I was a bit, I said, what? They said, yes, Jason will be there and he, he'll have his microphone. Hey? I said, yes, you'll be the, you'll be the interval, the half time entertainment. I've got a pack of cards. And you know what I'm like? I really do like the funny. Uh, Bottom line, did I get any laughs? Well, I got two laughs. Good. Two laughs, and it went very well. And I spoke to a number of Wolves fans afterwards, and they said, yes, we heard you. And, they, and I said, did I get any laughs? And they said, yes. <laughs> it was only some times later when I found out why they were a bit reticent. The laughs I got were from the Brentford fans. <laughs> Didn't go down well. The, the gags specifically being... Bully, this is just uh, an elaborate way of getting your autograph. And in these times of austerity, the £4.50 I'll get for this mm. will help. That was funny <laughs> to the Brentford fans. And they then presented me with a signed shirt. I mean, things like that don't happen to me. It's, it, and you, are, uh, you, you sound so great today, by the way. You, you're never not positive. I'm just you're excited full of, you're excited. You're so full of energy. I'm excited uh, so, today. So it's interesting cause it's to compare with how you are now and listening to you. Because we, we spoke about April and you said, well, when we spoke in April... And you didn't think you'd get to share this family with your Christmas. And back then you were scared and you were scared of what this journey would be like. Yes. And, and actually your point is that um, there is much that is awful about it. Uh, obviously, uh, there's no getting away from that. But, you know, you, you knew there'd be lows, but you didn't know there'd be the, these highs. We, we had no idea. I, 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 we, we've, we've retired from performing now. I had my last great adventure last Monday. And it was a, a lecture at the Magic Circle, the, the spiritual home of magic, certainly in this country, mm -hmm. where I'm very proud to be a member, as you know. And uh, I lectured. I was the sort of the attraction for the evening. And it was the most remarkable of evenings. I was made to feel so fantastically welcome. I, 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 from somewhere... From somewhere with the aid of drugs and support from a district nurse and a, and a magician called Diane, who actually was there in the capacity of nurse in the wings, just in case I became poorly, because I was really at a, at, at a rocky point. From somewhere, I had enough energy to not only perform, but to to enjoy the performance. Right. And, and And, you know... It's only me telling you this. I wish other people could sort of text in and that who perhaps were there and they could give you an idea of what it was like. Because when you're talking about yourself, it's it's very difficult because I'm only experiencing the emotion from my side to, to be so privileged to, 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 to for that to be my last adventure. There is a story that is too long to tell, but basically I have a hero and he never knew he was. And his name's Brian Sibley. He's a writer. He was the man who used to present Kaleidoscope on Radio 4. And they got him, without knowing he was a hero of mine, they got him to do the write-up of the event. 
first time he'd done so in about 10 years because he's also a magician. I mean, even down to detail like that, I just am left open mouthed on a daily basis. So yes. remember the link to this, mate. The link is what we said last time. Remember the, the, the caller that phoned in and we concluded we agreed with her that she was talking about the negative and the positive. And I simply said, look, having terminal cancer is negative enough. You don't have to bring your own stuff along as well. That's it. You've already got all the negative and entire street needs. So just concentrate balancing that out. And our life, our journey, I make it sound a lot more amazingly showbiz <laughs> than it probably is. No, but no, you do present the other side. You know, in our interviews, you do present the other side. But what is so fantastic listening to you, and this is why to a lot of people listening, and this is not an exaggeration. I can see on the text now that are coming in. I, I think a lot of people see you as something of a hero. And I think it's because uh, the way that you explain this journey that you've been on, particularly from the emotional side, is so insightful and so wise and so honest. I think you explain the experience of having this illness, mm. of having a terminal cancer, uh, in a way that no one has heard before. If I can embrace... To use a good you, word, Steve, an appropriate word, it's magic. If I can embrace uh, for seconds what you, what, what you have just said, there is a point now where... where there is information that I've gathered, and it's basically I have come to experience. Um, I've, I've come to experience what it's like to have now the district nurses coming in every day who do the pain control and the medicines. And in just one sentence, I'd like to say to everyone who is at that point: have someone close, someone who says, "If there's anything I can do for you, a wife, a spouse, whoever." Have them close helping you with that because the district nurses are amazing, but it is far more a complex process than you think. And that is, you know, today's words of wisdom, if you like. Uh, Have someone close for that part of the journey and it will transform it. Steve Evans is with me. He's here for the moaning. Hello. Hello. Well, let's read some text out first of all before we begin the moaning. Uh, Richard, what a, a great guy Steve Evans is. He should be an inspiration to all kids instead of these TV wannabes. A happy Christmas to you both, says John. Jeremy, uh, I was told on Monday that I was being made redundant, so thank you, Steve, for giving me perspective and for giving me strength. Lots of people saying what an inspiration you are, Steve. Kathy sat in a car on the drive listening to Steve. Don't miss a second of him speaking. He is amazing, with amazing in capitals. Uh, Steve Sy of Whitby says, Richard, love listening to this man talk. He's so incredibly positive and uplifting. If I ever have to face anything remotely like he has, I would love to have just a little of his courage. I have uh, years, uh, tears is what he means, of course, it's a yes. typo there. I have tears in my eyes listening to the emotion in his voice. Merry Christmas. Um, Steve, um, so tell me, so is, is, uh, you talked about your wife, Sep, who's with you in yeah. your posh shed slash yeah, yeah. summer house yes. at the back of your yard on ice. I'll let you get away with it. Go on. <laughs> and is, uh, tell me, how, how, how is Sep? Um, she's, uh, she's coming to her own now. Um, uh, it, it's strange, isn't it, really, that the, the hard climb uh, at the end of the marathon uh, it really is cruel. And she is coming to the end of this two year journey of having to deal with her own emotions, uh, having to learn how to care uh, for someone who she's been with uh, since well, we were 16 and 19 when we met. Where remember, now what she's got to do is what I can't do is because when I'm 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 a poolie boy, um, she has to make sure that I get the care that I want and she's not medically trained or anything. But it, there is there is no malice on behalf of our care providers. It's just that when you have people out on on the area, the district nurses who sh and and working in conjunction with Macmillan nurses must be given the very highest of praise, very highest of praise, uh, faultless. However, the rigour that they have to 
ensure that is present in their paperwork and their drug administration can be so frustrating. So Sepa's had to hit that frustration head on. And some days she's literally got in her car and, and gone to our doctor to get a piece of paper signed. Now her point, in order that I can have the drugs, and her point is that I've got her, but many of the people haven't. And it must be very difficult for them, people who haven't got someone who is active like she is. And that's the point that I made directly before the news. If at any point you are in a journey, you are in a journey like ours, just do that one selfish thing. Find yourself the best friend in the world. You'll already have them and ask them if they can be close by at this time. And boy, will they be valuable. What it a, really is important. That's good to hear. Um, uh, uh, she's very impressive, Seb. She she is, isn't she? Uh, what uh, what are your plans for Christmas Day? Um, I can't eat greatly. The joy of it is, I was a chocoholic. Remember the man who famously would would uh, would would steal his children's Easter eggs, meaning that they would put them into hiding until May when their value had gone up. And uh, I I can't eat chocolate. Uh, it's not that there's no, there's no um, anything. There's no, when I say can't, uh, the taste of chocolate is that of, uh, well, I suppose, a uh, uh, dishcloth. <laughs> it's just not a food I can consume. So um, we've got, uh, we've just bought a PS3 Have because, you? well, the, yeah, when the kids were small. Uh, they were very small, and they had a PS1, a PlayStation 1, and they could beat me uh, with me trying very hard on any game. And they were really very small. So uh, I've, I've, bought, um, I've bought a play, PlayStation 3 and the appropriate games because I like being humiliated. <laughs> Did, so, we, we must get on to the moment, but I just want to ask yeah. you, I know how much... Um, uh, how important it is for you to have family around you? And I saw that. They are they came to your house. And, and, and it, is, it is a blessing, isn't it? And remember the conversation we had, and I'm, I am mindful of the moaning myself, mate. But the Twitter family has grown. And I must use this opportunity within 10 seconds just to say thank you for all the unexpected Christmas cards that I've received, which we actually agreed would be sent via the civic halls in oh. Wolverhampton. And they've had quite a few. Right. So um, it, that really is humbling. And you, the presents that I get from them. But, but Twitter family care. They, they do. genuinely care. They do. Yes, this they is the do. side of Twitter people don't talk about. You hear the negative yeah. side a lot. And actually... The minority of people on Twitter are horrible. Actually, it's quite a compassionate place, Twitter, I think. My lot aren't. Um, do you, um, you know, you said earlier that you didn't really expect to be sharing this Christmas with your family. Do you have any targets left? No, nothing, Richard, nothing. It's, uh, the, the, the last gig was the, the wonderful uh, last adventure at the Magic Circle. Um, the thing with any of the targets is that am I physically capable of, of fulfilling them? I mean, there is a magic convention in February, but if I went to it, would I be physically fit enough to go? So now what I do, and again, this is my way of dealing with something that everyone on this journey must deal with in their own way, it, it, because it's common, it must be, and that is... How do I deal with this state of I'm right at the very end now? I'm still cognitive and I'm not particularly poorly, uh, but I haven't got long. And the way that I deal with it is that I do deal with it by being comfortable, mm. being happy. And although I can't sort of claim ownership of any of these thoughts, but you you live in the moment. You like yeah. to be happy. And if you can think of something later in the day that makes you happy, you'll do that. If you can feel strong enough to nip out, you'll do that. People come and visit, but it really is a, a slowing down. A, How are you, your daughters? Removing the tension. They are performing very well, and, and that isn't meant in any way to be condescending. They, they are naturally combative, naturally argumentative, and painful. And they are having to park all of those natural um, character traits. And I think that's very difficult. If you're in a family where my entire take has been to normalise our home life and to normalise so there is no elephant in the room, they still have to be mindful of, of 
of those things. So for them to put those natural propensities to one side is a great deal of effort for them. So that they've sort of changed, really. They, they really do try to work very hard with their mom rather than just rowing with her. Mm. You know, and, and those sort of things. And I think in families that have got cancer, smack in the middle of it, that is a great way to be able to help. Never mind the direct help with the person. How about not just finding it necessary to have a row to get it off your chest right in front of the person who's ill? Because when the two people you love more than anything in the world are eating up your valuable last weeks with them by rowing and shouting, that has such a disproportionately bad effect. So if there's anyone listening to this, if you want to give someone who's at that stage a present, just be nice to those around you and you won't believe the the, the force of good that will do. This is going to be the quickest ever moaning. Paul of Essex, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Richard. Welcome, Paul. You're Hi, Paul. with Steve and I. What do you want to moan about? Uh, I want to moan about Secret Santa, <laughs> Office Secret Santa. Um, it started off as a reasonable idea. You go out, you agree a small amount of money, you do something that's a bit funny that you pass on to someone else. But no, it's now, I mean, it wasn't that much fun to start with, but now it's been completely wrecked. People write lists, they tell you what you've got to buy oh. them, there's a value that's ascribed they to tell it. tell you, it's funny. Invariably, it's a, it's a flipping voucher. Uh, okay. Steve Evans. Oh, it's, it's, it's a secret, Santa. It should be a joyous thing, Paul. What have these people done to you? What have these people done to you? What would your idea of secret Santa be? Well, I think secret, for one thing. Yes. yes. Paul, you're saying they tell you what to buy? They tell you what to buy. Yeah. I mean, they pretty much, pretty much you know, told you who's going to go and buy it for them, what to buy. Okay. But now it seems that half of them right down there it's a it's a store voucher. It's rubbish, right? But Steve, keep, let's keep give him a quick pocket. For, for time reasons, Steve, let's give him a quick score. What would you give Paul out of ten? Well, well we're going to go seven because we're going to do the same as we did with the five up and down. But using seven, we can use decimals, so it it achieves exactly the same. <laughs> okay. So the second one will be based on the first one. Right. Paul in Essex, thank you, Stuart Market Harbour. Well, good afternoon. What would you like to moan about? Um, plugs, three pin plugs. Good and. I mean, there's lots of things wrong with them, but I, but I'll, I'll, I'll really just pick, pick pick one of them. I mean, the potential for pain from an upturned plug. I mean, it's like an indoor landmine. Mm. I, I mean, you remember the, you remember the film Die Hard, mm. where baddie, the buddy Hans Gruber saw that John McClane was running around barefoot, mm. so he shot the glass out to cut his feet. Oh yeah. Well, it had solved this. If it had strewn the floor with upturned three-pin plugs, it had taken the Nakatomi Plaza without a problem. Nice turn of phrase. Steve, mm. he thought that through. He wrote it well. A nice well, reference. What would you give him? He's gone for the stand-up element, hasn't he? Yes. Really? It wouldn't work for all audiences. But, you know, I, I, I think 7.2. 7.2, 7 I agree. It's got more structure. More structure, my friend. Uh, Steve, Stuart, stay on the line. You may well win. I thought that was rather good. Simon of Wakefield, good afternoon. You're on with myself and, and Steve Evans. What would you like to moan about? Good afternoon, gents. People who've got loads of kids, people who've got loads of kids at Christmas, especially people who've got loads of kids at Christmas and then buy your kids Christmas presents. Here's the deal. I've got a little lad. He's three years old. It's great. He doesn't really know about Christmas. I could give him an egg box, egg box and a couple of pipe cleaners. He thinks it's a PlayStation. <laughs> My mate has got three proper kids, proper kids who want good stuff. So I've done what any good friend would do over the last couple of months in that I've avoided him like the plague. He called me the other day, obviously withheld his number, just dropped in casually. He's got my little lad a Christmas present. Of course, my heart sinks. I've now got to get my carcass around Toys R Us and find four or five presents for his kids. Yeah. How selfish is that? That's, yeah, that's not a good very, guy. very good point, actually. I hadn't thought of that. There's an imbalance there between having a young mm. kid who, who they'll accept any or get, you can buy him a little toy car for 90p and they're happy. 13 year old. Uh, there's a minimum spend of about 25 quid, I would have yeah. thought. Steve, what do you make of this? Well, I, I, don't, I, I don't know whether it's, it's, it's not very, it's not a light moan. Someone was telling me that uh, for them, they've got uh, two children within their family group and it works out the, the other side, their spouse's uh, family, have got 18 children. <laughs> so um, 
the, the parents of the 18 buy for the two and you buy for the 18. Simon, get, Steve, give him a quick score. Uh, it, it's 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 too serious to win a light-hearted yeah. thing. I would say 7.1. 7.1. So, Stuart, you are this week's Mona Lisa, the Mona of the Week, Stuart and Margaret Harbour. And Steve is still with me here at the end of this, the prestigious Daily Bacon podcast. I certainly am. Um, so we will... I am away. Tomorrow's my last show. We're live at a homeless shelter tomorrow. And then... You are, yes. yes. And so then, your team were looking forward to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We found some great stories, I think. It should be a good programme. And then uh, I'm back, I don't know, like 4th of January or something like that. So we will um, we'll get you back on for the morning. And, um, I don't want to... I, I feel slightly guilty when you were saying that you're you, you're focusing your energies on this conversation on the radio and this conversation on the podcast. Yes. Uh, that's maybe a little bit... Um, Guilty, my, I don't know well, it's guilty, but it's, it's me, just let me help me you. Let me help you with that, with that, the, that, that sort of thing. Um, it, it, there is no guilt because uh, what else would I be focusing it on? People miss the point. I, I am in the house most of the time. My family are here. There is nothing they need from me at this time. They're at work. Septina has been within... She's held my hand all the way through the time. She's just this minute gone because a friend is coming to see us. Uh, she, so she's just this minute gone down to our house. So I've, I've held Septina's hand all the way through the time we've been together. And um, it hasn't affected me negatively in any way. But to be able to focus on something that's so joyous than talking to you and talking to you on the radio to still have the strength to do that if I hadn't have done this in the last hour and a half what would I have done if you think about the the things that people would normally say and say oh you should get some rest I've got tablets for that it's fine everyone looks after me fine if I've got a pocket of energy and I can time it so I can do something I really like I think after all the hardship that we've collectively had to go through, having this conversation with you is just about the best thing I could think of doing. Uh, I've never heard anyone conversationally in broadcast terms um, explain so insightfully, so wisely, so uh, wittily and so movingly uh, what it is like to live with this disease um and uh, it's been a great privilege talking to you steve as ever and it's it's in all the time that we've had together it has been an education for us because you have showed us people we've come to manchester and how we were treated in manchester was very humbling because you would have an in uh, an idea that people were used to dealing with with the famous and the valued, let's use those weighted words, shall we? Celebrity, valued, and, and, and you know, people who were important. Well, when we came to Manchester, by coincidence, as we walked into the building, because they were trailing my breakfast link, uh, I was on 40-inch plasma tellies yeah. all over the place, yeah. which was very strange. It took me a long time to get to the uh, t to the breakfast telly interview point. It took 20 minutes. It's a three-minute walk. Yeah. It's because people were walking from the other side of the open plan office arrangement just because they wanted to come and say hello to me, a bloke who just used to work for the council. So that shows you that what, what it's done for us it's shown, it's introduced us to these wonderfully honest and, and genuine people who we just never would have met. The, the, the incredibly strong people we wouldn't have met who have cancer. And those who work tirelessly every day to, to cure cancer, to fight this terrible disease. You see, I go back to our old hackneyed saying now, having the condition is bad enough, mate. Let's not add any more to it. But the benefits that we've had 
in the two years, the things we have seen on this journey and these incredible adventures we've been on and the way we are treated and they, they, they continue. The, the, the Brian Sibley writing up the review to my um, writing up the review to my last ever performance. I, I cried for an hour. Did you? Yeah, uh, that, that wasn't I, I, that wasn't because I was upset. It's because I just kept staring at the piece of paper. You know, if you take our life for granted, if you take our life and what we've done and how privileged we've been to live this journey, if you just take that as a norm, well, then really your idea of norm is a bit off. Don't you think? Yeah. Steve, um, I'm so pleased that we became friends this year. Um, yeah, I'm so pleased to use your phrase that you pulled me through the door. Well, it was a conversation Septina and I had over a long period of time because we knew where you were with it. We knew how close you were. And it, it's not something that's done lightly. Uh, give my love to Megan, Lauren and Seth. I will do. And have a happy Christmas. Merry Christmas. That's it from us on the Daily Bacon Podcast. Bye-bye. <laughs> On digital and online. This is BBC Radio 5 Live. bbc.co.uk slash 5 Live.